Once again, nice to be here with you today, and I hope you uh, had a good break and came back refreshed. And once I do want to just say again, thank you to Pastor Ashish and Amy for their kind invitation, to all the other pastors who have been helping and uh, been a part of this invitation, and it's a joy. It is a joy to be here with you today. This session, uh, we're going to talk about a very uh, happy theme. It's about peace. And I love the subject of peace. It was the theme of the angel song in the second chapter of Luke, the night that Jesus was born. And this expression is there in the scripture, peace on earth. But you know, when you and I look around our world today, we don't see a whole lot of peace, do we? And I, I did bring a little video, and uh, our media department put it together for me. <laughs> Thank you, media department. And maybe we can just show that. You can see what I was, what we, what we see when we turn on our televisions or what we hear when we read our newspapers. Uh, this is the kind of things that our world, and I see their heads together back there. Let's see if they get it. If they don't, we'll go without it. Oh, there it is. little bit uh, upsetting. I almost didn't show it. I had them put it together for me. I said, I want you to show me problems that affect women today. And they put it together. And then I thought, I don't even like to, I don't like to see that. But we do know that we live in a world. Let's just pray for a minute before we start. Father, we just come in Jesus' name this morning. Lord, we know that you came to bring peace. But we know that there is an enemy in this world and that there is strife and there is war and there are struggles, not just on the world level, but there's struggles in our homes, in our families, sometimes in our hearts. Lord, we're just praying as we look into this message for the next little time this morning, that you will indeed speak peace to our hearts, that you will help us, Lord, to understand what we can do to have the peace of God and to know the peace of God. We thank you. We pray that. And we pray for our world. Lord, we pray for our sisters around the world, the troubles that they face. And Lord, we're just believing that through your intervention, through our witness, we will be able to help to build your kingdom here on earth, here in India, here in Bangalore, that the peace of God will come to this city in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. 
What does the Bible say about peace? It's all the way through, of course. And we are all familiar with the Old Testament word for peace, shalom. Everyone knows that, I think so. That means peace. It's the Hebrew word. And it means soundness or completeness, uh, security, welfare. Uh, sometimes it was used, talked about it's, uh, peace between two countries, stopping the fighting wars between two countries. Other times it was talking about agreement uh, of arguments between people, people agreeing together, and they used the word peace. It also was used to describe persons, uh, individuals where, uh, that were prospering materially, like Abraham. He was, you know, they used that word also for that and free from mental or spiritual disturbance. But really, the richest portrayals of peace in the Old Testament come in the Messianic scriptures. And we're all familiar with these. These are such beautiful, beautiful. I just had to put a few of these down. The Messianic child, Isaiah calls him the Prince of Peace. Zechariah, I love this one in Zechariah verse 9. We use this one always... Uh, just before Easter, in uh, this is kind of an Easter message. Your king comes to you lowly and riding on a donkey. He will proclaim peace to the nations. And, of course, you have to go to Micah as well. There's a beautiful scripture in the third and the uh, fourth chapters and the fifth chapter of Micah. But I'm just going to do, well, maybe I'll read Micah 4, 3. Why not? It's so beautiful. I don't have a slide for it, but Michael... Micah 4.3 says, talking of the Messiah, he will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. This is the part I love. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. This is, of course, speaking when the millennial kingdom and all of us say, Lord, speed the day. When we see the munitions around the world, it's just so scary. I mean, they're making more and more things to kill more and more people. I'm waiting for that day. But then if you go to the next chapter, chapter 5 of Micah, is the beautiful Christmas promise. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. That's verse 2. Verse 5 says, he will be our peace. Beautiful, beautiful promise. This was so many hundreds of years, 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. But when you come into the New Testament, it's, there's a bit of a, a, a change in emphasis. The Greek word, which I wrote down there because I don't know how to say it. <laughs> I think it's, I don't know what it is. I don't know. I never took Greek. It's, you can see it on the slide, and if you can say, if you're good at Greek, but it means inner tranquility. I can read English. And we're talking, actually, we're, there's a change here from the external, the peace of, you know, nation against nation and persons fighting persons, to the internal. In the New Testament, peace is no longer simply the well-being, well-being state of mind, or uh, it has moved to an internal thing. I love this. The Prince of Peace that Isaiah and Zechariah prophesied about had come, and peace is a person. In the New Testament, Jesus said to his disciples, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Uh, Paul proclaims it in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14. He himself is our peace. Jesus was the very personification of peace. So how important is it to understand? It is very important to us because it is talking about our Messiah. It's talking about Jesus. So I want to think for a while this morning about what are the conditions for peace with God? What do we have to do to receive God's peace? And of course, the very first thing that we just have to do, and I think you ladies know this, but maybe you're here today 
and you aren't sure about this or you haven't made this decision, you cannot have peace in your heart, in your life, until you have received forgiveness from sins. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, Paul writes this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm in Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm going to be uh, talking about several verses in Ephesians chapter 2. This is actually the greatest peace mission in history. Paul describes it right here in Ephesians chapter 2. It's a beautiful passage, starting with uh, verse 11, actually, but I'm not going to start there. But this is what verse 14 says. He himself, we're talking about Christ, is our peace, who destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. He himself is our peace. This is what you need to know about the, what are we talking about, dividing wall? Go back to the temple in the days of the apostles, when Jesus was there, it was divided into various courts. And of course, inside was the holy place and the holy of holies, but then there was the women's court, the Gentile court. But there was a wall about three or four feet in height that ran through the temple area, separating the court of the Gentiles from the inner court, into which only Jews were permitted. Now, it had an inscription on this wall. This is chilling. This, is, this was in the temple in Jesus' day. It said this on the inscription. No foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the sanctuary enclosure. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. I mean, the whole, the, if you were not a Jew and you went on the wrong side of that barrier, there was no mercy for you. It, may, it was a death sentence. I just want to say today, thank the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. By his sacrificial death, he tore down the wall. And how did he tear it down? Jesus Christ paid the price for sin. He came into the world to do that for us. The cost for destroying our separation from God was the precious blood of Jesus. It's there in verse 13 of Ephesians chapter 2. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, you were on the other side of the wall. There was a prohibition stated, if you cross this wall, it's death. You who were far away, have been brought near. How? By the blood of Christ. This is the beautiful price that was paid for our sin, the blood of Jesus Christ. Literally, we know that the night or the evening when Jesus was crucified, when his spirit left his body, when he died, the veil of the temple was literally torn in two from top to bottom. He tore down the wall. But there's another beautiful verse in this, uh, in verse 16. It talks about what he did. I'm going to skip down to verse 16. It talks about in his flesh. It's really talking about how God joined the, gave both the Jew and the Gentile. It's such a beautiful passage. Freedom to come to him, that salvation is for everyone. That's a very important, but very important fact. Verse 16, in one body, he reconciled both of them to God through the cross. I want us to look for just a moment at that word, word reconcile. The word reconcile means to bring together again. You know what's happened in our world? We, we know. There's so much separation. What causes separation? Sin. From the beginning of time, sin has separated man from God. Look at Adam and Eve in the garden. They hid from God because of sin. Look at what happened to their children. They, because of sin, brother was separated from brother. One of them murdered. 
the other one. Sin is such a separator. What happens in our world today? What happens in our families? I mean, how we need a reconciler. The wife who's grieving for her husband who's left home and he hasn't come back. The children that are grieving for their father. They want to be reconciled. They want to bring together again. That's what it means. Bring together again. The mother wants to be reconciled with her uh, daughter who's run away from home and who doesn't want to serve the Lord. They want to be reconciled. The lost sinner needs to be reconciled to Christ. This is so important in our world to bring peace. You can't have peace until you there is reconciliation to bring together again. And Adam and Eve, they, they suffered. Noah suffered all through, even when I, I think about the flood, everybody was destroyed in that day because of sin and because of separation. Then I look at our world today, how the world doesn't send judgment on us all, I, I don't even imagine. We need to be reconciled, but I'm just in the, that portion, Ephesians chapter 2. In verse 14, it says of Jesus, of Christ, he himself is our peace. In verse 15, it says, he made peace. Number, verse 17, it says, he preached peace. That's why I said, this is the peace mission. It's just so beautiful. You, you just need to study it sometime on your own. Beautiful, beautiful portion of scripture. Beloved, I just want to say this. Until you have made peace with God, <laughs> you, you cannot experience true peace. Unless your sins have been forgiven, unless you have confessed that I need you, Lord, I need you as my Lord and Savior, when we make that confession of our sin, when we admit that we're sinners, then the blood of Jesus Christ can bring us together, reconcile. We can become one with God. I just want to say, if you're here this morning, if you're hearing this message in anywhere, if you have never made peace with God, if you've never received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, would you do it today? If you want to have peace, that's where peace starts. That's the beginning, the first step for peace. But for those of you who know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, this is another very important condition for peace. We must walk in the will of God. Paul says it in Colossians, the third chapter, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. The peace of God has to rule in our hearts. Now, that word rule, it's an interesting word. It's actually an athletic term, and it means to preside at the games and distribute the prizes. Now, we know that. We see the Olympics on TV. We watch games and even other sporting events. There's always an umpire or somebody, you know, sticking, making sure people abide by the rules. In the Ancient times, the Greek and the Roman games, there were judges or umpires who rejected the contestants who were not qualified or who disqualified the ones who broke the rules. The peace of God is the umpire in our believing hearts and in our churches as well. This is what I mean. When we obey the will of God, we have his peace within when we step out of his will, even unintentionally, we lose his peace. I, I, as a pastor, I can't tell you how many people, especially young people, when you minister to young people, they always want to know this question, Pastor, how do I know whether I'm in the will of God? And so, you know, we, we list several things if you're abiding by the scripture, if you're doing what his word says. But one of the tests of knowing the will of God or being in the will of God is, do you have peace in your heart? Because if you have peace, if you have the peace of Christ in your heart, that's what the scripture we read said. He will be 
you're in your heart, God will warn us. When we step out of his will, boom, peace is gone. We will be so restless. We will be not content. We'll know something's wrong. I often pray that way. Sometimes I think we all get in this position. I don't know. I have two choices, and I'm not sure what to do. Well, I can't just stand there all day and all night and tomorrow and the next day and the next year still trying to decide which is right, this one or this one. So I've learned this over the years. I look at them, and I think, which one do I think is pleasing to God? Which one do I think will bring the most good? And I do that, knowing, knowing that if I choose the wrong one, if I start in the wrong direction, the peace of God will immediately be gone in my heart or in my spirit. God will warn me. He'll stop me. You know, if your child is going to make a mistake, if they say they're on a road and you know that there's been a flood and the, the road is washed away and the way they're going, there's a precipice, they're going to fall off, would you warn them? Would you say, don't go that way, don't go on that road, there's a drop off there? Of course you would. You would warn them. Now, what about our Father, our Heavenly Father, who knows all things and who does all things for our good? Would he warn us if we're doing something wrong, if we're walking in a wrong way? Of course he would. You know, we trust him. We know he loves us. He's not going to let us make a big, terrible, horrible mistake. He'll let you make it if you insist, if you insist. But if you listen for the peace of God in your heart, he will warn you. How do I know the peace of God is an umpire? It will tell me, it will stop me when I'm making a mistake. It will help me to know what is God's will. But I want to say this about the peace of God. A word of warning. Hmm. Peace of heart alone is not always the peace of God. You know what I've had young people say to me? Well, I've had other people say it too. They have said, they, I, they'll say to me, Pastor, I'll ask them. They're going to do something. I'll say, well, do you have peace about that? Oh, yes, Pastor, I have peace. But I want you to remember Jonah. Do you remember Jonah? He was running away from God, the prophet Jonah in the Bible, and he was in a lot of trouble, but he, he thought he had peace. He went down in the hold of a ship. He was running away, got down in that ship, went sound asleep. He had, you know, it wasn't, usually if I'm upset about something, I can't sleep. Not Jonah, sound asleep. And they, the sailors had, had to come down and wake him up when the ship's about to sink. You know, he thought he had peace with God, but his disobedience created a great storm that day. I have had young people say to me things that are absolutely in contradiction to the word of God. For instance, marrying unbelievers. I had a young woman say to me one time she was going to marry an unbeliever, and I tried to dissuade her. And she said, no, pastor, I prayed about it and I have peace. I tried to tell her that God will never ask you to do something that's against his written word, against his, what he says in the Bible. And then she said this, I think God is trying to teach me something. She did it. She did it. She learned a lot more than she expected. I'll tell you that. I'm sorry. But, you know, she, God won't teach you something that's not in his word. Believe me. Trust me, if it's in his word in black and white, you can believe it and you can act on it and do what is in the word. If we have peace with God, this is something I think is so important in a church setting with our, all of the ladies that are here today, you'll have peace with one another. You'll have peace. Do you know, this is sad, but churches are known not in your church. No, no, no. Not all people's church, and certainly not in all. <laughs> I'm sorry. We're known for church fights. The church. Not we. Not we. They. Those other churches. Not we. In fact, I had somebody tell me very recently, I was in, inter in an interdenominational type of meeting, and another pastor was telling me, he said, you know why so many people come to your church? I wanted to say because we're really good, but I didn't say that. I, and he said, because they're tired of fighting in other churches. And I thought, well, good, send them on over. Send them on over. Because, you know, in our church, God helping us, we're going to have the peace of God. 
If you have peace in your heart, beloved, then you're going to have peace with your fellow believers. If you don't have the peace of God in your heart, you're on your own. You are so on your own. And sadly, this happens in the world. But just be careful because if you're out of the will of God, you will be out of the will of God in the bigger context as well in the church. You'll, there will be discord. Lord forbid that all people's church will ever have discord, that you will be a place of peace where people can come. I can remember years ago, now this wasn't the church, but this was our home. A doctor used to come. She was a medical doctor. And she would visit us, you know, any time of day, you never knew, she'd just turn up and she would, and we'd be sometimes busy, you know, sorry, Dr. Hannah, we really don't have time to visit. She'd say, no, 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 you go on with your work. She said, I just want to, I just want to be in your house. She'd say, I feel peace here. <laughs> she would sit in the living room and she'd lay her head back in the chair and we'd go about our business and she would just lay there. I thought, God bless her, let her soak it up. If there's peace here, she can have it. There's plenty we'll share. But, you know, if you, are, if you have peace in your heart, you'll be a blessing. You'll be a blessing. Another condition to having peace is to guard your mind. Beautiful scripture in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Such a beautiful verse. Now, they're in Philippians. i got to get there. Just hang on a second. I'm in Corinthians. I'm going to go back because there are several verses there. These are really good. I know Philippians is in my Bible. <laughs> oh, come on, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. I went backwards. Okay. <laughs> Philippians, and I'm going to talk about a couple verses there in chapter 4. There's four conditions to being guarded by the peace of God. And they're, they're practical. Let's just say practical things. First of all, let's look at verse 4. Well, we already started there. Uh, no, this is verse 5, not 4. We, did, we started in 4 about rejoicing. We've already rejoiced. Now we're going to do something different. Verse 5. Let your gentleness or your moderation be evident to all. Uh, the NIV says moderation, uh, or it says gentleness, and I think the King James says moderation. Some translations say forbearance. What it means is, in order to have the peace of God, you have to bear with other people. Now, don't get this wrong. This doesn't mean, you know, we think of bears, we think, Rah! you know, not that kind of bear. Not that kind of bear. This kind of bear means endure, put up with. Have you ever had people who uh, you had to ask God to help you to bear with them? Yes, I think we all, we all do. But if you want to enjoy the peace of God, you have to bear. You know, why is that so important? Because, because God wants to develop the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of patience in us. Paul exhorts in 1 Thessalonians 5.13, live in peace with each other. He says it just like that, live in peace with each other. But in Philippians chapter 4, in verse 6, it says this. Do not be anxious about anything. You know what that means is? Do not worry. <laughs> Do not worry. I don't know. I think women are natural-born worry wards, don't you? I think so. I mean, we worry about, you know, we worry when before we get married, we worry about finding the right man, and then we get married, and we worry about our husband, and we worry about our children, and we worry about what to fix for supper, and we worry about the world. I mean, it, we just do that. You know, I understand that. We're all the same about that. I think so. But to have God's peace, we, it says don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, here is the antidote, prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. When you feel worry coming on, it's time to pray. And, you know, I, I have all kind of nice quotes about worry, but actually I don't have time. I'm not going to go there. But that's one of the conditions to guarding your mind. 
And let's look at the third condition. We find that one in verse 8. Finally, it says brothers and sisters. We'll just say sisters. We don't have any brothers here, do we? Ah, oh, the musicians and the camera people, the media people. <laughs> Thank you, brothers. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, we, oh, that's a big, long thing. Uh, if any, and whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, hear about, here it is, think about such things. That's what I want us to say. We need to think about things that are noble, things that are right, things that are pure, things that are lovely, things that are admirable. Think about such things things. You cannot enjoy God's peace when you allow unwholesome thoughts into your mind. I think this is what we have to be careful as mothers to guard our children's minds. Because you know what? They carry the peace defeater, I don't know, right in their hands. You know, every young person carries a phone, right? And it's, it's not, they don't carry it, it's connected. I, I think the wires go straight in, you know, up there. I don't know. I mean, I, our young people, if you see them without a phone, either they've lost it and they're in a very pitiable condition, or I, I, I don't know what happens, because you never see them without it. It's connected. And you know what's in there? There's a lot of things that destroy peace. That's all I'm telling you. There is so much garbage that comes across the internet. And in, in social media, oh, me, oh, my. I have teenage grandchildren. It is a battle. Honestly, we fight, and I have, I don't, I, not where they are. I have to fight it in prayer over and over. I, every day, I call their names, and I speak Jesus over my grandchildren every day and every day and every day. Why? Because there's somebody that's out to destroy their peace. And it's, you know, it's like horns and, you know, point and tail and all that. But it's right there. It's just as close as their, their own right hand. You cannot enjoy God's peace and have unwholesome thoughts. Guard your mind. Think right. And then not only thinking right, but when you go on to verse 9, Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, Paul says, or seen in me. Wow, he was a good example. Put it into practice. Whatever you have seen, do it. Put it into practice. Not only thinking, it's right doing. The last condition that I'm going to talk about right now for enjoying God's peace is to practice the things that Paul has told us to do. He said, I, I told you about all this. Don't worry. Uh, think right. Uh, bear with your brothers and your sisters. Now the emphasis talk, turns away from the things that we have heard and seen to what, what are you going to do? How are you going to live? Whatever you have learned to receive or heard from me, put it into practice. And then what does it say? The promise is, and the God of peace will be with you. You want the God, I want the God of peace with me. But to have the God of peace with you, you know, he doesn't stay in vessels that are unclean. And he doesn't stay in vessels full of worry. Then I want to move on just to another thought, is to trust God. This is a beautiful Old Testament scripture. I've been pretty much sticking with uh, Paul and Peter and James because they're wonderful teachers but Isaiah says this, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they what? Trust in you. Now, I want to ask you, what do you think is the picture? If you had to paint a picture of perfect peace, what would you draw? I'm not an artist, so I, you know, I can't, I can't even draw stick figures very nicely. I'm, I'm really just really bad. But I heard about two artists, and you may have heard this too, and, but I, I never forget this, that uh, they were asked to paint a picture depicting peace. So the first artist, he made this beautiful, peaceful scene, a garden, which this is so pretty. Ladies, I love this. I don't know who designed this, but this is so pretty. Your backdrop here, beautiful. He, you know, flowers and trees and birds twittering in the treetops and just, and, you know, just everything 
The sun is shining. It's just that kind of a day. So lovely. Peace. The second artist had a very different idea of what would, would represent peace. He drew a very stormy picture, like a wild monsoon day. We've had some of those recently. Rain lashing down, and he painted it on the seaside, and the waves are just splashing up. And it's just a wild, uh, uncomfortable, stormy scene. And then until you look, and right in the cleft of the rock, there's a little bird sitting on a nest. Just as calm and quiet. She's sitting on her eggs. She isn't worried about the storm. She's not worried about the rain. She's not worried about the waves. Why? Because she's safe. She's in the rock. She's covered. This, I believe, is the true interpretation of peace. Beloved, we don't live in a calm, beautiful world. I wish we did. I wish I could say our world was like that. But I, I'm a newsie. I watch the news every day, pretty much every day on television. And there is, this is, world is in such a mess everywhere. So much trouble, even in our own countries. So much inequality. So many unfair things happen. And I think, how can I ever have peace in a world like that? How can we have peace? It's such an awful world. But I want you to know, you have a rock. You have a rock. Who is our rock? I love the way the psalmist says, you are my rock. You're my rock. You're my high tower. We have our protection. Where do I go in the time of storm? You know, there's an old hymn. You know, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. I love that. I love, you know, the old hymns. Nobody knows them but me. He's a rock. He covers us. You don't have to worry about, is the storm going to happen? The storm is going to happen. Are the rains going to come? The rain's going to come. But when you're covered, you have peace. This is what I believe is me, our the peace that when we trust in God, we don't trust in the world around us. We don't trust in our governments. I thank the Lord for our governments. I pray for our governments, but I trust them. No, but I trust God. I trust him to cover me, to keep me in his peace. But there was another thing I just couldn't get away from. it. It's not exactly listed in this, in this scripture here, although it is. It is here. I wrote it down. I found it. I found it. <laughs> I want to read verse 11 of chapter 4, verse 11, Philippians. I am not saying because I mean, he's talking, oh, whatever, never mind. He says this, I have learned, this is what he said, to be content. I have learned to be content. What did he say? Whatever the circumstances. You know, that's not an easy thing to achieve either. I read about General Booth. He was the founder of the Salvation Army. And when he was elderly, he went blind. And one day his son Bramwell broke the news to him. He had been to the doctor to have his eyes tested. And the doctor said he will be blind the rest of his life. So he told the general. The general said to his son, you mean I'm blind? I'll never see your face again? No, Bramwell replied, probably not in this world. The old man's hand moved across the covers until he could grasp the hand of his son. And he said these beautiful words. Son, I have done what I could for God and for the people with my eyes. Now I shall do what I can do for God and for the people without my eyes. Content. Content. I have heard it said, if you cannot do what you like, you must like what you can do. Sometimes we have to do that. Don't struggle. Don't fight. Don't argue with the Lord. The Apostle Paul says it again in Philippians 4.11, and I just read it. I have learned to be content. I have learned to be. I read a beautiful poem. I almost brought it, but it was such a long poem, so I didn't bring it. Amy Carmichael, who we're familiar with, that established the Donover Fellowship. It was a, uh, she was trying to talk about peace. It was a poem about peace. And she kept going on. You know, every stanza, she went and looked here for peace, and she looked there for peace. And finally, toward the end, you know, one of the last stanzas, she, she said, even obedience, even obedience didn't bring peace. And then 
the very last stanza said, acceptance. In acceptance is peace. In ex that's contentment. Lord, not my will. Your will be done. That does bring peace. But I want to end, and I'm not stopping right now, but this was something which I felt so strongly to talk about. The condition, one of the, I don't know if it's a condition for peace, but when we have the peace of God, the commandment of God is this, be a peacemaker. I want to talk about that for a little while this morning. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. That's in Jesus Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. We're all familiar with that, the peacemakers. This is the beautiful picture. When God came down to become our peace, he wrapped his love in flesh. He sent... Oh, oh. Are we back? He sent Jesus in bodily form. It's so beautiful, the Apostle John. I love how he says it. God became flesh and dwelt among us. Would we ever have understood the meaning of peace if he hadn't wrapped his love in flesh? Would we ever have understood the depths of his love if he hadn't given his life on Calvary? He came in the flesh so that we could find forgiveness the glory of the one and only Son, John says, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The marvelous coming of Jesus in bodily form. We call it the incarnation. We talk about it. We celebrate it at Christmas time. But I want to suggest this morning that there is another part, perhaps another side to the incarnation. That is our side. What God wants us to do, it is our willingness to to stand in the place of Christ in the world. You know, Jesus was only here for three years. He did everything the Father expected of him to do. He, he was here 33 years. He ministered for three years. Let me make it, let me fix that. He walked the dusty roads. He taught, he healed the sick. He raised that, he did everything. But his final purpose was the cross, and he died in our place. But then, you know what happened? After he raised from the dead, marvelous, marvelous story, the story of the resurrection, he went away. He left. And he left it, everything up to us. How he trusted us, I don't know. How he trusted, you know, have you ever thought about how he trusted that early church? How he trusted the 12 disciples, for goodness sake. What a motley crew they were. Uneducated. I mean, you know, temp some of them had, you know, tempers. Some, I mean, some of them were, I, you know the 12 disciples. I don't need to talk about all of that. But, you know, he said, I'm going to go away. But he, he said, I want you, I want you to take this message of peace. I want you to go into all the world. I want you to make disciples. You know, he left the task up to us. Mind-boggling. We are the present-day part of the incarnation. This is what I want to say. Your neighbors, the people that live in your building across the street from you, the people that work in the office with you, they will never believe what you say about Jesus Christ until they see him wrapped in human flesh, until they see in your life evidence of what it means to be a true believer in Jesus Christ, until they see you being a person who bears with those who are unkind and unlovely, until they see you loving the unlovely, until they see you being patient with them, even when they try to push all your buttons and they know just exactly where they are. When they see Christ in you, then they're going to be willing. They'll listen. They will have a hunger for God and for the peace that they can have through God. They have to see Christ in us. And then they'll be open to receive the gospel. Romans chapter 12 and verse 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone.
not always easy. It says, as far as, it's pos- far as it depends on you, you have a choice. You have a choice. Now, how can we accomplish this? I, I just, I think we have to do what Jesus did. What did Jesus do when he came to bring peace, to be our peace? He, we have to be willing to be emptied, to be poured out, to be spent. His blood was poured out for the salvation of man. And I believe that the more we're emptied, the more filled we'll become with his peace and with his presence. There's a beautiful illustration in the scripture. And it was, it's a story that's important enough that it's in all, uh, not all four, it's in three of the four gospels tell this story. And it's the story of Mary of Bethany, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, anointing the Lord with that exquisite perfume. Remember that? They were, in a, they were at a something like today. I think they were probably, I don't know if they were sitting at tables. They say the Jews used to recline at the table and have their meal, you know, on a, I thought, boy, that's a way to eat, you know, re, you know lay at the table and we don't do that. I don't know why we should have picked up on that. That's a nice way to eat. Anyway, uh, they were having a dinner and she interrupted that dinner with the most unusual thing. Suddenly crash, the sound of breaking it wasn't glass, it was alabaster, it was stone. But I, I have a feeling it was very thin, I don't know, I wasn't there. But suddenly the sound of breaking, and then a fragrance began to waft through the whole room. Actually, a very expensive offering, uh, I'm gonna read what Mark says. Mark is the one he, of the three gospels who tells this part of the story. Mark chapter uh, Somewhere. Five, is it? I've changed the page and I've lost it. He says this. When he, Jesus, was in Bethany, reclining at a table in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and she poured the perfume on his head. Now, the interesting thing about this nard is that uh, actually it comes from you know where? India. India. That's what it said when I was studying. It said India. So, you know, if you can believe everything you read, that's what it said. And the, it was such an extravagant gift. It actually represented a whole year's worth. I mean, it, her, an annual income would be needed to purchase that ointment in that alabaster jar. And to express her love for the Lord, she broke it and just the whole thing, the whole thing, and poured it on his head. Very expensive, very extravagant. I just want you to notice the two verbs in this sentence. She broke the jar and she poured the perfume on his head. First of all, she broke, she broke. Brokenness is a requirement for usefulness in the kingdom of God. Before God can use us, he has to break us of our pride, our self-importance, our desire to do things our own way. The psalmist says it so beautifully, a broken and contrite heart, God, you will not despise. And I love this quote. I put it up on the slide from Vance Havner. God uses broken things. It takes broken soil to produce a crop, broken clouds to give rain, broken grain to give bread, broken bread to give strength. It is the broken alabaster box that gives forth perfume. It is Peter saying, Peter weeping bitterly, who returns to greater power than ever, the power of broken things. It's not easy, is it, to be broken? We, we, again, I said, you know, in this day and age, we want to be strong. We want to be powerful. She broke the jar. Then she poured out the perfume. Now, ladies, you and I know that's not the way to put on perfume. You don't do like this. You just take a dab and you you know, a little here, a little there, if you want to just squirt a little, you know, it's not, I don't know. Just a little, little. That's all you do, especially something as expensive. You know, that's more expensive than French perfume at the airport. You know, it's just so costly. You don't 
Just dump the whole thing at one go. You put, that's not the way you do perfume. So wasteful. You know, even the criticism. You could have spent, sold that and given the money to the poor. Says Judas, you know, of all people to criticize, who, wasn't, who was stealing from the money bag himself. You could have given the money to the money bag. Ah, so extravagant. But she was not ashamed to publicly proclaim her, her love for the Lord. You know, Jesus himself said, I love this, I think it's in, which gospel is it in, one of them, uh, that wherever her name is mentioned, this deed is going to re be remembered. It's, we still remember it, don't we? We remember it to this day because it was such an extravagant thing. It was such an unusual thing. We still remember it to this day day. Unless you think that that much extravagant is really too great a price to pay, being poured out, remember the words of our precious Lord, not only his words, but his example. But this is what he said to his disciples at that last supper when he knew he was going to be facing the garden, the arrest, the trial, the crucifixion. Actually, Paul records it in 1 Corinthians 11 too. He, this is my body. He took that bread and he said, this was a total departure from the, uh, pro, what they always would say at uh, that festival. It, you know, it, it just was not, Jesus totally departed from the script. This is my body, Jesus said, broken for you. We, we celebrate it every month, don't we, when we have communion. We take that bread and we say, we recognize, we remember, as Paul tells us to do, this represents his body broken. Beloved, his body was broken for us. And then in Matthew 26, Jesus, in his own words there at the Last Supper, this is my blood poured out, poured out, for many, for the forgiveness of sins, not just sprinkled. This is one, of course, this is not the reason we do baptism. We don't do pouring and we don't do sprinkling because his blood was poured out. It was, he gave maybe every last drop of blood, we don't know, was given for our, the forgiveness of our sins. What happened when that jar was broken? This is, my, I think, my favorite part of the story. The fragrance. It's there. It's in the book of uh, John, chapter 12. The house was filled with the fragrance. Hallelujah. The house was filled. When she was willing to break, to pour, that fragrance filled the whole house. She could no longer hug her precious. Who knows how long she had that alabaster ointment. Now, obviously, uh, Mary and Martha were not poor ladies. If she could buy that expensive perfume. I don't know if you do. I don't buy perfume that's that expensive. I look for the knockoff, you know, the one that's supposed to smell like that and taste, you know, costs a lot less. That's what I go for. But she had the real thing. She had money. I mean, that was a year's worth of... She had it, but she gave her best at the feet of Jesus. She started a wave of blessing that goes on and on, even to our day, even to us here today. The jar has to be smashed. I think, you know, when we come to these services, I know, ladies, and I'm with you, we want to be built up, we want to be encouraged and I'm sure you will be. You have a good speaker coming. I hope, sister, you can, you can repair all the damage I'm doing this morning. <laughs> you can encourage everybody today. But you know what I've learned? We need to be broken before God can use us. I don't mean that we have to just be shattered to the point we're just a trembling mass of nerves. Not like that. But you know, my will has to be broken. My my desires. I want so many things, but I want God's will to be done. I want to be used of God. If I want to be used of God, I have to be willing. I have to say, Lord, here am I. You know, do what you want with me. 
you know, I'm willing to be broken, to be poured out. The world, we have such a needy world, ladies. And I look at you, at so many talents, so many abilities, so much joy, so much faith. You know, I, I just think of the future. I think of all the things that God can do and will do through your lives, through your testimony. What God will do, God will do great things. I know he will. The angel proclaimed peace on earth. That's the wonderful thing about the peace. It's universal. Everyone can have it. But it only comes when we're willing to be God's peacemakers. Are you willing to be a peacemaker today? There may be a price to pay. I don't know if it'll be a year's salary. We don't all have that much in the bank, for goodness sake, let alone in our pocketbook. Yeah. I love what Jesus said just before he returned to heaven. He says this, John chapter 14, not returning, but just before the crucifixion in the la at the Last Supper. He said, he said to his disciples, I am leaving you a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give isn't fragile like the peace the world gives. So don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. He has come to give you peace today. Whatever the situation, I don't know what your situation is this, this, this morning or perhaps it's, after, it's afternoon. Some of you are facing situations that you think there's no solution, there's no remedy. But Jesus said, I'm living you a gift, peace of mind and heart. Because when we have the peace of God in our heart, it makes us equal to any circumstance. It makes us able to bear. It makes us puts us in a place where we can be strong. Even though we're weak, we can be strong. I just, I'm just praying today as we come to the end of this uh, part of this, the uh, ladies' meeting, the Lord will use you all to be peacemakers. You're here to get pumped up, to get encouraged. But when you leave this place, when you leave this beautiful room, you're going to go out into a world that's pretty ugly. You know that. Your office, maybe even your home, I don't know what situations you face. Maybe your children, your in-laws. You have situations that you have to face. But please be assured that God will be with you. I want to just, I'm going to close with a blessing. I'm going to pray for you. And I love this. It's really a benediction. And it's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 16. And I'm going to pray this over you. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. Amen. Amen. God bless you, ladies.